Hello, Tom Lebecki here. Today we're doing a special live. Um, this guest is a guest that I've interviewed very recently. Um, just give me, just give me one second. Very sorry. When you got young children, it, it's really hard uh, to do a live. So forgive me. Um, but that being said, though, um, we're doing a podcast live today. I don't do a lot of lives. Um, this is an important live. We're going to have an open and candid conversation with Dom Sakali. Uh, former Bonanno captain. Um, I've interviewed him recently. So for those on the replay and those check it out on Mobsters Inc., I'll put it uh, above and below in the replay crew. And then obviously, if you're watching it live, check it out on Mobsters Inc. The reason why this is an important discussion is I, I, I got challenged in a good way on this one. Uh, Dominic said, I want you to ask me anything and everything. I want everything on the table. I want everything to be clean. Um, I've been critical of Dom in the past, even without realizing it. But I think there's a way to be critical with being respectful. Um, I think there's a way to have this conversation and this dialogue, bridging the gap of former informant, as well as bridging the gap to people that want to consume this qual uh, quantity, but trying to unpack and really realize, you know, what's true and what's not. Um, so again, this is uh, Tom Lavecchia. We're doing a collaboration with New Theory and Mobsters Inc. The way the questions are going to work is I put on multiple communities an opportunity for people to submit questions. Those questions I'm going to go to first. The next up is memberships and then super chats. Uh, so stay tuned. You're watching New Theory and Mobsters Inc. Hey, Dom, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Tom? I'm well. I'm well. So just to keep very everything transparent, didn't send you any questions ahead of time, didn't send anything to give you any type of uh, leeway. This is the first time you're being asked, and you said I could pretty much ask you anything, correct? Yes, that is correct. All right. Uh, and again, if, uh, uh, the foundational interview I did with Dominic um, uh, a little while back, two weeks ago, did fantastic in terms of numbers. But it's not about the numbers. It's really understanding who Dominic is. I do want you to refer to that, but let's jump right in. Um, I did want to talk about some areas that we may have in commonality, believe it or not, is um, is uh, the China Club, right? You talked about it a few times. You used to hang out there, correct? Uh, I went there a few times. Not, I wouldn't say hang out, but I went there on a few occasions, yes. Oh, okay, okay. So maybe, <laughs> okay. So, so I used to go there a lot. Um, the people that I knew were actually happened to be bananas. So I was just wondering, uh, was that a banana spot? There was something going on with there and the penthouse. I actually got this from an ex-fed. Um, there was like some money laundering and there was um, some counterfeiting going on back then. Um, was that kind of you guys or you have no knowledge of that? No, I had no knowledge of that. But in my time going there, that was a Genevieve. They were, under, they were around the Genevieve crime okay. family. The, okay. uh, pen, the, not the penthouse, I'm sorry. The uh, China Club was with the Genovese. Got it. And interesting enough is a penthouse. Um, I was with somebody who told me it used to be a West Side place. Was it West Side maybe after you or or yeah, go ahead. Penthouse. No, it was never a West Side place. What happened was the build out was done by Kava Construction. And at that time, they were around the West Side. And at okay. one time, they were actually buying the penthouse from Bob Gantz. Yes. Metropolitan Lumber. Yeah. Uh, he also owned the building the sound factory was in Yep. because he was going to give me the building to take it over when they moved out, when they got shut down. But um, the penthouse Close club was owned by Bob Gantz. He was supposed to sell it to the owners of Kava Construction. Yeah. And then he never did. He pulled the back. And actually that first year, they made $5 million there. Wow. That's in the surprising. first year. Because I know the owners of Kava were sick about it. That should have been their place. So what I want to do is we're going to get to your stuff and get to some of the critical questions. But before we do, um, you know, I, I've heard both sides. I heard a lot of, I actually know people that benefited by working with the mob and construction. They were associates, they stayed associates. Maybe they got away with non-union labor. Maybe they got union, but were able to kind of finagle. Um, give me kind of your, how you kind of infiltrated the construction industry and what was that business model like? Originally, I started out when I came home from prison in 1999. My uncle Peter, who played in Goodfellas, oh, yeah. Pete the Neck, Pete, and Goodfellas, who's Pete the Killer. 
He actually got me a job in Local 7 in Jersey. That's the Tile Marble and Terrazzo yeah. Union. They had the uh, the Bricklayers Union out of Philly yeah. was around the Lucchese crime family. So he, the BA, which is the business administrator for the Bricklayers Union, got me into Local 7 in Jersey. Yeah. Um, I, I started out as a helper. I always remain the helper, making labor, great right? labor. They call it. No, labor is something different. I was okay. a helper to a mechanic. Yes, it's labor or work. Got it. Uh, where I do the cleanup, I set up for the uh, mechanic. So I'm behind the mechanic that, and the mechanic's the guy who lays the tile. Got it. Um, my brain's always going, trying to make money, trying to see how I could come up. So I had the old timers teach me how to read blueprints <clears throat> when I was in New York. Uh, I had the connection at the Hunts Point Meat Market, so yeah. I decided to bid it out. I got the last look. They got, gave me the job. Oh, wow. And what was nice about organized crime myself, even though I wasn't a made member, I was around yeah. Vinny at that time, Yeah, was the fact uh, it was a union job. I only had one union employee working. The other four or five were non-union. So I, I made a killing off that job. Yeah. yeah a lot of money. Now, in retrospect, because you, you know, and unless I'm missing something, but my research didn't show any recidivism in terms of getting rearrested, no crimes, that kind of stuff. So you've been on the straight and narrow. And I think you mentioned you work in construction. Did you really need the mob back then? And if so, why exactly? I didn't, but I was in that influence. I was, it's like peer pressure. Yeah. Well, it is, uh, but on a different level, you know, coming out of federal prison, I had so many mobsters that you look up to them. It's a glorified, as silly as it sounds, the life itself is glorified until you get involved and, you know, you understand the treachery of the life. And like a lot of these young kids today, and at that time, I was a lot younger, but I idolized people in that life. And I want, of course, everybody wants to be in that life, be part of it. And uh, at that time, it was great until, yeah. you know, you find out there is no loyalty. There is no loyalty. And that's where I became disenchanted with the life. So, so you, you and I talked about this and you were an earner. You had, you know, you're making good money. Um at a time that the mob was kind of, you know, post Messino where the mob is on its heels in a little bit, but you found a way to like still make money. Right. So, so what I'm getting at is the banana specifically w did have some power and you were making some good money. Is it fair to say that when it benefited you, right. You, Hey, less labor guys, better margins, better money, better opportunity. So you, you, you benefited from the banana affiliation, but then when it didn't suit you and it came to self-preservation, it's kind of you turned your back on it. Because I really want you to unpack that for us. Yeah, you could look at it that way. But I didn't turn my back first. Okay. The crime family turned their back on me. Remember, okay. I got locked up for committing murders on the crime family's behest, behalf. Yes. And yet, where was the loyalty? My boss is wearing a wire. The other boss is talking about me killing people. That's how I got arrested. Yeah. Otherwise, I never get arrested. He's telling Joe, Vinny Bastiano is telling Joe Messino, Dominic killed him. Dominic took care of it. So, and then when I'm locked up, I mean, they, they were like vultures, everything. They just plucked me dry. So where is the loyalty? So what? I should stand up and stand tall, which I should have. Yeah. And I always said I took the easy way out. But- I was tired at that point. It's like enough's enough. I'm sick and tired of being a scapegoat, being used, um, especially when I was so loyal to the life. So, but then, but yeah, but then I have you as, and take this as a compliment. I have you as a captain, which is, and I look at it like you know this: the distance between an associate and a made guy is miles apart. It's not as close as people think, and I think I believe you know that. And I also believe me personally, you're welcome to disagree. Um, um, the distance between a soldier and a capo is also miles. Think about this. There are probably, and this is being at best, 
50 to 75 capos in all of New York. So you kind of transcended to a really important and powerful place, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why I bring that up is because you were in management, because you were kind of pre-administration, could you have handled it better? Hey, I know Mike, my, my, whoever, I don't want to say his name, but whoever's the boss now, he's taking my crew, taking my team, they're misaligning. But you know what? I got my uncle, I got my cousin, get a sit down. Like organized crime is there for a reason. And you were, you weren't just some like associate or even a soldier, you were a capo. Do you think you could have maybe handled it differently to maybe keep some assets, get some revenue in without, without, because you're a resourceful guy without rolling? Give me your kind of thought process on that. I tried. You okay. can only do so much when you're incarcerated. Yeah. Um, I even had the Genovese crime family interacting on my behalf, but by then it was too late. Things were gone. Okay. And like I said, I said this once and I'll say it again. Even Quiet Dom told me it's a disgrace what they're doing to you. If Vinny comes to this pod that I see him, I'm not going to, no disrespect to you. I love you, he said, he told me, but I'm not going to acknowledge him. That's how upset he was about the way I was being treated. And I'm not making excuses. Yeah. I did take I take the easy way out. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. But you know, I blame myself at the end of the day for believing in the life, believing in the people in the life. That's my fault. Shame on me. And I like I said, I just got fed up with it. It was enough was enough. How much of the decision in retrospect and now even? was business and how much of it was personal? I think it was all business. Uh, okay. Personal on the effect was, I'd say more business. It was, it was business because I've always said loyalty is a two-way street. Um, you know, yeah, I was upset. Michael Mancuso took my crew, yeah. which in the life our code is, especially I'm in an administrative position, at least wait, God forbid, if I'm convicted, then what's the sense of having an acting captain in your place? Yeah. An acting captain is put in that position to run your crew in your absence. Whether if should you get arrested, because say I get a, I'm convicted or I take a plea to three years, yeah. you don't dismantle my my uh, crew for three years. And here's a here's another scenario. Yeah, Michael Mancuso just went away. So what? Another boss should take over. No, they're there for him. Even when bosses have life, like um, Amuso, Amuso, uh, Persico, yeah, they're still in charge. They're still in charge at the end of the day. They don't get dismissed, put to the side. So why so should at, a captain be dismissed and put to the side? So, so at that time, um, you were very, and you still are, uh, very vocal about Vinny kind of being your rabbi, your sponsor, your protege, and so forth. Um, when, when things started going haywire, right, in the beginning, when the beginning, right. taking your crew, taking your assets, did you feel, did you ask Vinny and him not protect you as much as you wanted? Um, or did did you feel like, like give me kind of, because like, to me, Vinny was a very powerful guy and still is in a sense. Um, why didn't, why wasn't he able to remedy it when things started to happen initially? Because for his self-preservation, he knew the way Michael felt about me. Um, when I asked Vinny, I said, what, when I found out, I'm like, what's he doing out there? Why did he dismantle my crew? Words, Vinny was like, Bo, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I'm fighting this case. Um, it was all about Vinny at the end of the day. Yeah. Vinny didn't want to shake the tree at that point because, like I said, you only have a certain amount of power out there. Yeah. Um, and Vinny felt if he argues with Michael, you know, Michael's out there. He's on the street. He's going to do it, make his own decision, especially that Joe Messino cooperated. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's different. It's hard. It's a lot harder. Now, if Vinny was on the streets and I was locked up, then it's a different story. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just uh, it's difficult. But every time I mentioned something to Vinny, Vinny didn't know. Like okay. So things from me. Okay, so now um, there's no playbook, there's no rule book, there's no management development courses in the mob, right? Correct. However, there's precedent, right? So when you got there and you had and you had Vinny as an upline, if you will, I'm uh, sorry, yeah, Vinny as an upline. Did generally the banana guys when they were in jail, their families were taken care of. Um, um, you know, what did you expect, and what did, what did you see, like actually over your years in Cosa Nostra, and what were you expecting when you went in? Because obviously, mm -hmm. conflict starts when there's misalignment between 
what you expect and what happens. So what have you seen in the past and what was happening to you? I was expecting loyalty. I was expecting my son's mother to be taken care of, which she was. Yeah. And it's funny, the only person who was taking care of her every month was the guy who was convicted for killing his father, Anthony Daz. He was giving her five thousand dollars a month, and Anthony was around me. Yeah, and he so was an associate; he wasn't even a May guy. Exactly, and you know, he even sent fifty thousand for my attorneys. Wow. It's like with a crime family, nothing, and not that I asked anybody for anything. I wanted my construct. What I did ask for was help finishing out my construction projects, so I could cash out. Yeah. I'd be able to pay my grandmother back the mortgage money I borrowed from her. And I would have millions and millions of dollars at my disposal to do what I needed to do. And and I would have stayed true to the life. But at the end of the day, I got no support, no help. And they robbed me for everything. So you know what? Uh, I was done. I was done. Okay. But, but, but you got to forgive me. I'm a little neurotic. I'm a little like too controlling. Like to me, you're on the street and you're an Italian guy. It makes sense to be in the Ivy League, of, which is Cosa Nostra, right? But what I'm getting at is, you know, you get schooled a little little too, right? Was it ever vocalized to you by Vinny or anybody? Hey, listen, if you go in the can, we got you. If you go in the can, you stay with the Italians. You're going to be getting this this much a month. This, you know, your legal stuff, we're going to take some of it from you. But you're going to keep your – like, what, what I'm trying to get is, specifically, what were you expecting? And then why were you expecting it? I know loyalty is two-way street. I know right. the talk track. But I want to push you a little harder between, were you going sure. a little naive? Or you were told explicitly what to expect? No, I'm going off of what's supposed to be done, our rules. Okay. Um, okay. I didn't ask for help. I didn't want help. The only help I wanted was help me out with my construction projects to finish them out. Correct. Vinny said, well, Dom, I could only have Robert do so much. That was his partner in construction. I'm like, Vinny, really? You're building homes all over the place, You're right down the block from where I'm building my home. Yeah. Please finish it out. And it was all about Vinny and Vinny's family. And um, it, why do we have a war chest? We had a war chest money. Well, that's my question, yeah. Okay, you have a war chest money. It's there to help people in jail. It's there to help people that were entrenched in the life, help better the life, help put Michael in that position. Correct. Um, so, not to, and I didn't need the money at that time, but don't rob from me everything. Listen, there was even women in the neighborhood that I heard. It's a disgrace what they're doing to him. It's a disgrace. From having everything, my son's mother had to move into an apartment that was about 750 square foot, pregnant at the time, yeah. or when she just gave birth. It, you know, it was disgusting that people in the neighborhood, and word got back to me. Why would a boss in a different crime family say it's disgusting what they're doing to you? It's disgusting. It got to the point it was so bad, he even told me, I'm not going to acknowledge Vinny. Because he felt Vinny could have controlled it, but Vinny didn't. So, but then I look at it like this, right? Because I, I spoke to you uh, on, on air, off air. I, I've been yeah. following you a while. We have a mutual friend, Ed Scarpo. You're not an idiot. I, I, anybody can kind of, we can, listen, you guys can throw as many darts as you want at the guy. The guy is not an idiot. Which oh, thank although, you. You that in, although you called that in one of the interviews. Which yeah, I don't like that's on, okay. Uh, Newsday, but we'll get to that too. And I'm, I, I, have a, I have my feelings on the media, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But you're not an idiot, right? So, so you didn't have your like assets in your second cousin's name, uh, separate LLCs, uh, money in the Caribbean. Like you were making real money. Why didn't you have your kind of getaway, you know, clean stash from Cosa Nostra being kind of the smart, savvy guy that you are? I wasn't expecting to be locked up. Remember, if Vinny, number one, Vinny's broaching a topic, you don't speak about murders. You don't yeah. talk about it. Especially in a prison cell with cameras, guards, other people there. Um, and he should have known better. He should have known better. If he does not mention me to Joe or answer Joe's, I never get arrested. I'm not arrested. So it's just, and to, I felt I was doing a lot of legal things and they caught me at a vulnerable time when I had all my finances tied up into properties. Yeah. Now you got to forgive me for being overly, you know, overly law abiding, right? I'm in business. I got lawyers. I got an accountant. Um, I got, you know, people that I, that I trust with my stuff. 
how do like how is something in Dom Sicali's name or your LLC's name? How did like the mafia get that out of your like? I get the legal stuff. You lost your book. You lost your Shylock. The street right. stuff I get right. But how do they extract legal entities out of Dom Sicali's name? It's easy when you have mortgage companies. You have people in the business. All they do is forge the name, rubber stamp it, and so be it. How am I? How, number one, how am I to know? And then from there, it's just done. What, what am I going to do? Rat? I'm not ratting. Remember, I'm not a rat at that time. But what is it? What does that look like? So your 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 wife or your cousin goes to collect the rent, you know, from one of your places, and they look at you like, oh, I, you you don't own this anymore. Like, how do you find out about this? They didn't know. They didn't know where rents were coming from. My real estate did, and Vinny's son was there, my partner in the real estate office. So you're talking the first four months I was under the Sam's Act. I had no phone calls, no communication. And within those four months, when I finally did get the phone, I was speaking to my mother, Dom, what should I do? Everybody's calling me. You're four months late on mortgage payments, this, that. I'm like, I'm sorry, Ma, I just claimed bankruptcy. There's nothing you can... What am oh, I so they were able to take the assets out of your name, but you were still on the hook for any liabilities. Of course. Well, wow. after that, then it came out of my name. As okay. far as the real estate office went on, the, the body shop got milked for everything. Just like in Goodfellas, when you see they busted out of the restaurant, they busted out the body shop on me. Wow. And um, even with the home, same thing. I got no help with anything. And uh, we had a bar lounge called Envy in uh, on Tremont Avenue. Yeah. I heard Vinny's son sold it, kept all the proceeds. And it's like all of a sudden he bought a house, got his wife, uh, his former wife, a big engagement ring. They went on a cruise. I'm like, where's all this money coming from? It's just, you know, it's. But I want, I want to pack that. I remember, I remember Envy and I remember it on Tremont. My question to you, though, is, um, is, uh, um, was your name on the title or you were like a, a behind the scenes, like do you have a straw man and the oh straw man got screwed for you or were you on the, were you on the, uh, the title? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure at this point. I think it was a corporation we were both on. Got it. Um, where he could sign off on everything too. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cause I, I think a lot, a lot of it in is exposure, right? Like you had some people obviously change stuff illegally then you had some exposure. Maybe they had power of attorney or maybe they were majority partner. So that stuff kind of makes sense on how they did that. So I was always wondering how did they kind of extract those assets? Let me continue with the questions. So you were first incarcerated due to a murder over a drug dispute. Um, was that cause and Nostra related? And what's like kind of the summary that happened there? No, that wasn't cause and Nostra related, even though there was people from cause and Nostra there, associates, strong okay. associates. And that was just... Um, Guy was trying to kill me, and end results, I killed him. Did that, because I, I believe it was a drug dispute, afterwards, by you killing this guy, and then obviously doing time, in that world, did that kind of help or hurt your standing in going into Cosa Nostra? No, uh, at 22 years old, that enhanced my credibility a lot. Okay. You know, it showed I was capable. Even though, even before that, I was always capable. So I was known as to be violent, explosive, where... You know, I never back down. All right. So in my research, the the, Ran the Randolph Pizzolo um, murder, I understand you try to save him at first, but ultimately wind up killing him. What happened there? Just unpack that whole thing, if you don't mind, in, in some reform, if you don't okay. mind. Okay. Randy was a street guy around me. Uh, yeah. Before he came around me, he was around Johnny Palazzolo. Okay. And he was just wild. Johnny had him do everything, go out there create havoc, especially in restaurants. And then I could come in, the rest, the owners will start complaining. I'll say, listen, I'll control them. I'll make sure you don't come. I need this from you every month, your, my protection. It's an extortion scam. Shocker. That's what we had Randy doing. Yeah. Uh, so when Randy came over to us, I read him the riot act, told him he has to stay in line. I tried saving him when Vinny got aggravated, but it got to the point, Randy's big mouth is what sealed his fate. And then at the end of the day, I had to uh, follow orders and take him out. But but my understanding is you actually try to help him in two ways. One, get the hell out of here. Go to Florida. And two, hey, man, if this guy goes to Florida, can we save him? I understand you try to help him. Yes. 
yes, but Randy was thick-headed. He said he'll be under control, he'll watch his mouth. But once he got the liquor in him, you know, there was cocaine too. Yeah, so he became uh, King Kong. All right, so I'm just, I'm trying to, respectfully trying to be in your mind frame at that moment where Vinny's your boss, your upline. You didn't really want to do this. You followed orders, which is the way of Cosa Nostra. Were you a made member yet? Yes. Okay, so obviously you definitely have to do it. We always have to do it, but then you really had to do it, right? But didn't that kind of tweak a little bit of like, wait a second, this guy could didn't have to go, but he went. Didn't that at that point really start to weigh on you? Be like, fuck, I need getaway money. I don't know if this is for me. There's going to be somebody else that's going to get an order against me. It's going to be my close friend who's going to kind of save you. Again, being a smart, reasonable guy, why don't you unpack it maybe that way? Or you did, but you turned a blind eye. That's something that, that I'm really kind of interested in hearing. No, my loyalty was, was with Vinny. Okay. That's it. I, To be honest, no, I like Randy. Yeah. I can give two shits whether he lived or died at the end of the day. I, I did try to save him because I felt it was unnecessary. Yeah. But Vinny wanted him dead. I'm like, okay, you're, Lord, you, you're my brother. So that's easy. I could have avoided it when Vinny went to jail, but Michael followed up with the order. And at the end of the day, I could have avoided it too. Said there was a lot of heat on me. But I knew I would have been disappointing Vinny at the end of the day. So I, act, I had it done. I had to act. How did you do it? Uh, I had Anthony Aiello meet him. I was at a net game. And the rest is history. That night it got done. And that was it. So we mentioned earlier you took a life prior in a drug deal. This was, I understand, your second, first time you felt a certain way. How does it feel killing a second person? Your well, that, mother, was my third, that was my third hit. Third hit, sorry. sorry. So forgive me, sorry. So third at that point, is it like, hey, another Tuesday? How does Dom Sakali feel after taking a third life? It didn't bother me. To, you know, remember, these guys are in the street as well. Yeah. Randy was no slouch to violence. Uh, he shot somebody in the leg for no reason, stabbed another guy in the hand in the restaurant, but like put a steak knife through his hand. So uh, he was also a dangerous guy. And to me, it's just like going to war. When you're in the mafia, it wasn't an, if it was an innocent civilian, yes, that's a different story. But you're in the life. This is a guy, if Randy was asked by Vinny or Michael, I need you to take Dominic out. You'll get your button. Randy's killing me in a heartbeat. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. So, and also you have to remember one, my mind focus when I'm in the mafia, you're emotional, emotional lists, you're cold. Yeah. You can't have that softness in you where now uh, I'm a human being again. Yeah. I'm myself. I don't have to be hardcore anymore. I could be normal, Dominic, where back then you have to be hardcore because if they see weakness, they're going to eat you up. But so, so because you were kind of had the pedigree, you were trained, you were incarcerated, so you knew. And one of the things I learned from having the show with John Panisi was I always thought of two kind of wise guys, right? You had your earner and you had your money guy, but he introduced a third, a politician. And I'm just wondering, you don't, and, and I take this as a compliment, actually, you don't strike me as a politician or a, politi a politicker. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I'm not, I don't, a politics, pit, a politician bullshits. Yeah. So I'm for the straight, reason, the reason, I'm straight up, I, I get the way it is, I tell it the way it is, and that's it. So the reason why I bring that up is as you grow with organizations, right? So you are a capo or even a soldier. You met Mikey. You never kind of liked him. I understand you even had an order to kill him. And there's a lot of stuff there going on. And then as he ascended, let's say, quicker than you and even higher than Vinny, um, it, you were on the wrong side of it because he didn't like you and he, he now had the reins. Do you think if you were more political back then and more of a bullshitter, right, and you had a better relationship with him, that some of this may not have happened the way it happened? Um. Well, as long as I was on the street, I would have always had Michael in check. Michael's never going to take anything from me or do anything. I don't care. He was the boss at that time, the acting boss. He would never be able to take it because he knows I would I would move on quick. Yeah. Of course, now that I went away, I think Michael still, Michael's a vulture. 
Yeah. He couldn't rub two nickels together himself. He had a few dollars coming in here, there, doing yeah. his little things. But Michael was always – he wasn't known as an earner. He was just – you know, he was just there. You know, he was more known as a washwoman. Um, you know, he didn't work. He, had, he would have a few dollars coming in for all different things. And that was it. You know, Michael was a very jealous person in my eyes. Okay. You had the unusual responsibility of having 25 guys under you. We're going to kind of get into that structure in a minute. Um, I, I've heard, I talked to other guys and heard other guys that were in the situation and you either got to kind of crew up, stay quiet and you may die and lose everything or flip. You kind of have three options. Was there ever a thought to maybe crewing up of your 25 guys? Did you have fun? You know this, if there's 120 guys, you don't need to kill 120 guys. You probably got to kill two strategically and get some of the guys that call the shots on your side, right? Was there ever right. a, a, a thought that you had 25 guys that some were loyal to Dom, uh, Dom Sakali, like they were, you were loyal to Vinny. Was there ever a thought of maybe crewing up and, and starting a coup? Um, I couldn't uh, because then I would be going against Vinny. Got it. And I felt Vinny was still, I know Vinny was still in control with Michael. So I couldn't. And then I had no resources. I have my main guy, Ace, he's in jail. I mean, just, it was just chaotic out there. Okay. And remember, they limited me with my visiting list. They wouldn't let me and my phone list where I couldn't have the people I wanted to come see me. So you couldn't maneuver in, in, right. even if you wanted to. Um, all right. According to Daily News, um, I believe this was during Cross, so forgive me. Um, it says you admitted to lying at times to avoid jail. Um, if that's a case, is that true? And then why should I believe you now? I admitted to lying, not at times, one time. And that was in regards to my cousin, okay. who I gave him a bag of guns with uh, machine guns, silencers. It was like a big army bag. Uh, I know he had access to it. And then I, when he came to visit me, I told him to get rid of it. This is after the four months. So he got rid of the bag. So when I came in to cooperate, I lied to them about that. And then spoke to my lawyer after my proffer session for that day. My lawyer said, Dom, you have to tell them the truth. So the next day I went in, my lawyer told the prosecutor, listen, he has to tell you something. And then I told him, I said, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to tell on my cousin. And they got mad at me. We could rip up your agreement. Uh, we understand why you did, but there's no excuse. Just tell us everything and let us determine what to do. And uh, that was it. It seems like you made it right because you went back in. But you could at least understand why that could be problematic, correct? Well, yes. The only reason why I did go back in and tell the truth was my lawyer. Got my it. lawyer advised me to. Otherwise, I would have never said it. I would have kept yeah. my mouth shut. All right. So, um, again, according to my research, you admitted, as I understand, to taking out $280,000 in loans against your grandmother's house. Yet on your show, I believe you denied, you know, sticking it to your grandmother. Can you please walk it through because in my research, that appears to be the elephant in the room. Okay. Number one, it was hundred and I think 198000 There was okay. already existing mortgages on the house okay. that enhanced it to that number. Um, I asked my grandmother for a loan. My grandma would do anything. And I'm going to be doing a show with that. Yeah. With, uh, Joe Barone, okay. who was very close with my family. So listen, there's always three sides to a story. If I rob my grandmother, everybody who knows me, who got to know me on social media knows I don't have to BS. Yeah. If it happened that I robbed my grandmother, I would say I robbed my grandmother without her knowledge. She didn't know. My grandmother was well aware, took out the loan. Um, and what I did at the end of the day, I was paying all the bills. So the existing 110,000 mortgage that was on the house, I was paying, making those payments paying her taxes or insurance and my payments every month. And my grandmother was happy as a pig and shit with that. Yeah. Um, and then she said, just pay me back. When I got locked up, there was no income coming in. And that's when the mortgage didn't get paid. But she never got thrown out of a house. Years later, she did a reverse mortgage and took another $200,000 equity out. And when I do my show, I'll let everybody know. Who stole that money? Who robbed that money from my grandmother? It wasn't me. I was locked up. But it's funny. 
People are saying she was homeless. I left her homeless. And yet my grandmother came to visit me while I was in the Witsack unit. My grandmother even gave me around $10,000 total while I was incarcerated. So if I would have robbed her, she's gonna, I'm going to be in her good graces. And then to end it is, it's funny. This all came out after I cooperated, before I testified in Vinny's first trial. I'm pretty sure it's before I testify in Vinny's trial. All of a sudden, my grandma was given a statement that I robbed her. She had no knowledge of it. And in my show, you'll hear who was behind it, who pushed her to say that. And it was all to be in Vinny's good graces. Okay, so I, I, I don't ever like to mention names. Um, in this case, only because it was part of the research and this is public sure. information. It was a, a Nancy Sakali who was with your grandmother talking to the journalist and, and giving information along with her to make sure it got out there. Uh, is she your aunt, as I understand? Yes, and being that you brought it up, this is the same Nancy Sakali. Did not go to my grandmother's funeral, did not visit my grandmother in the hospital when she was dying, did not go to my grandmother's burial. Yet when my grandmother passed after the burial, she was the first one in the house taking everything out of the house. So need yeah. I say more? Okay. Like I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, asking no, go ahead. questions of good faith. Yep. I, I can only... Um, it's you know, public knowledge. Yeah. All right. So a former juror called you, and again, I don't think you're an idiot. I could stand on that. But a former juror, juror called you an idiot uh, as per Newsday and claimed to be pressured to provide a guilty verdict against Vincent Bastiano and cited some of, you, some of your cross- um, just unpack that a little bit. If you can give me kind of your thought on, on that, that happened well, at, afterwards. They're right. I am an idiot for getting involved in the mafia. So um, what can I say? That's their opinion. Yeah. Like I said, uh, you can't please everybody in life. And I'm right. sorry I didn't have uh, an education. So, you know, it's not my fault. All right. So the way we're structuring this, guys, the questions were asked on an open forum. We're not filtering them. If they're positive, there are some positive, which we'll get to. And some are a little challenging. The next one, a little more in the, the latter part. Uh, Dom, you claim to be an advocate for women's rights, yet you back up uh, a guy who beat up multiple women. This is alleged. Uh, he waited for a robber and everybody to leave his home when he pulled uh, in his wife out of his bed, essentially referring to Gene um, and I believe one of his, Gene Barella, one of his uh, home invasions where it, it's, it's alleged that he uh, tied a woman up, did assault her, um, and, and also now something new came to light with Gene. So you may maybe change your opinion. You're welcome to share where you, where you are real time. But one of the challenges was that you are, and I, and we talked offline where you, I believe you do believe in women's rights, but some people are challenged with that when they feel like you support somebody like Gene Borello. So if you can just share your real time thoughts and even historical, uh, on that situation. Well, about him robbing somebody, tying up the woman. That's part of the game. If you're going to, was he supposed to let her loose in the house? Let her stay free? You're robbing somebody. Um, <clears throat> as far as putting hands on a woman, I don't believe uh, that. Um, I don't believe in that, definitely. Yeah. Um, I know there's talk about his recent arrest that he bruised her. Where are the photos? Show me the photos. That's all I'm asking. Show me the proof. There's always three sides to a story. Gene yeah. showed me where he got stabbed. I posted it. I showed it stab, stab wound in his leg. So, you know, everybody that wanted to throw judgment on somebody on a on things that were alleged. If you show me the proof, the fact, then I, you know, I don't like it. Yeah. I won't like it. Yeah. But, you know, I'm trying to support him. And let me ask you something else. A girl, a girl, a woman comes at him with a knife and stabs him. How do you expect him to get the knife out of his hands? If, now, I'm just saying, if that's me, if a woman comes at me, stabs me, what am I supposed to do? Oh, 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 and get stabbed again? Yeah. I'm going well, well, I, I to do it. I'm going to do what I have to to defend where, myself. Where I, I uh, trust me, I, I don't know if I can now, but uh, I did go up to Brown Belt in uh, Kempo Karate and Samurai Jiu Jitsu. And what I've always was taught, even to this day, and as an Italian American, even, just you neutralize it as the best you can with minimal or no harm to the female. 
So if a woman does come to you and she does get the better of you and stab you, um, doesn't mean, you know, you disarm, but bruising back. I don't know. I, I, I'm not, not, I'm not, you're welcome to sh share your opinion. Well, Tom, think, just, of it, think of it this way. And I'm, yeah. I apologize for interrupting. Yeah. No, no. A woman comes at me and stabs me. I'm going to try to throw her. I'm going to do what I have to do. You, know, you want to neutralize it, correct. Women bruise very easily. Yeah. Just maybe her hitting. And I'm not making excuses, folks. Yeah. I'm just telling it the way it is. Yeah. Whether I push her hard, she goes into a counter, she falls on her butt, they bruise very easily. Yeah. Where I just don't understand it. You're defending yourself. So yeah. I just yeah. tend to agree. Now, just to go and hit a woman, crack her because she has a mouth, big mouth or something. Yeah. No, that's not right. That's not right. But if you have to defend yourself, listen, you do what you have to do. I'm sorry. That's the way I feel. Woman or not. And I am a woman. I'm out there for women to help women. Yeah. But what? They're supposed to show no respect. They could come at you with a knife and stab you, and you you oh, can't do anything. Come on, guys. Well, well, I, I do believe that, um, especially in the age of feminism, if you know, um, if you want to be treated equal, um, you should. Uh, but in that situation, self defense first, neutralize and move on. Exactly. Yeah, there is possible chance for collateral damage. Um, I don't want to make this about Gene. I just wanted right. to check in on, on that. Um, also in the past, and I know you re definitely regret it, I believe, you joined up with Sammy and, and had zero problem <laughs> with with any of the, you know, Alan Kaiser stuff um, when he was sitting across from you. Uh, but when you kind of got burned by him, this is according to uh, the viewer, uh, you seem to have a problem. So why this sudden have a moral compass after he screwed you? Um, I overlooked it with Alan Kaiser. I really didn't know the facts of it, what exactly happened, and I didn't want to know. And yeah. I've always said I'm not one to do research about the mob. I never did. Yeah. So I really didn't know the particulars of it until I started talking with people. And, yes, I did avoid it. I overlooked it. And then when I asked Sammy before I've fallen out, once I started hearing a lot about this Alan Kaiser – I said, let's come on my platform. Let's do a story. You need to address this and show remorse, apologize. Sammy's exact words were, why would I go on your show when I have my own platform? I said, really, Sammy? Really, it's all about you? I thought you were going to help me out. My platform helped me to grow. And that's why I just knew Sammy was all about Sammy. I don't think that you're going to find a shortage of people that don't like Sammy in the chat and that watches what did you learn about Sammy, really learn about Sammy, um, you know, by dealing with him and then after? Um, I learned to believe, thank God I didn't know him back in the day. Thank God I wasn't his friend back in the day. Thank God I wasn't making hundreds, tens of millions of dollars back in the day and close to Sammy because I would have been dead. Sammy would have tried killing me and taking everything. So that's yeah. what I found out with Sammy's personality. All right. So I, I, I do believe because, um, and again, I researched Dominic. I knew of Dominic before. Again, we share at Scarpa as a friend. Um, we, we touched on the other interview, so we don't need to do it now. But he, you did go overseas into Africa. You really try to bring potable water uh, to the masses, obviously for a profit at the time. Um, but nevertheless, you wind up doing it as a humanitarian. So you have done some things, whether it's been repentance, just good business, or whatever reason, you've done a lot of you know, the right and nice things. However, um, I'm a data guy. I'm a marketer. I know you're a smart guy. You talk about a lot, doing a lot for the kids. And I don't want to discount that, especially in good faith. But let's look at the demographics of the mob genre people. It's 35 and older. It's all men. Probably less than 1% um, uh, are kids that are, you know, influential to get into this life. But you do preach about doing it for the kids you know, on your show, but they're probably not watching. So like, are there other avenues that I'd like to hear and see that you're doing stuff for the kids outside of the show? And I'm not knocking what you're doing on the show. Right. I think you're doing the right message. I just don't think none are watching. So, well, yeah. I thought about that as well. However, even though I am preaching to the kids, it's affecting a lot of the older men. Okay. Where they might be going – and I get a lot of comments. They hit me, DM me, they email me, thanking me that my show helped them, gave them the encouragement. So my message to the kids is actually translating into the older people who yeah. are going through their own trials and tribulations in life. 
and it's helping them instead of the kids. So it is working, even though it's not where I want it targeted to. And who knows? There might be one or two kids that it does work for. I doubt it. And I say that, too, because when I was that young, I wouldn't listen. Even when I was in my 30s and 40s, I wasn't going to listen. I would say, ah, this is all BS. Now, uh, there are other informants that are on that um, – that, um, let me just see. This is actually a uh, – we'll talk about E.G. Vodka in a little bit. Um well, actually, yeah, I was gonna say, why did you have to? Why did you have to flex on me? I, I got the yacht master, and you're rock, rocking the RM. You had to do that to me, Dom. Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought. Well, I had this on all day. You could at least match my energy, you know. You had to, you know, kind of. <laughs> kind of you know, I love it. But okay, we'll get to watches in a little bit. But so okay, so you talk about the kids stuff. So I did want to address that. Um, of the informants, though. You, you don't want to – some people think there's a spectrum. Some people want to just kind of see it black and white. I think it's a little more nuanced, just my humble opinion. People are welcome to have theirs. Um, in your situation, um, and like Mikey Scars kind of seems to be along that same thread, no excuses, coward's way out, that kind of stuff. It seems to be that you are trying your best to take some ownership over what you did. So just unpack that a little bit on – you know, where you stand and how you do admit that, you know what, you're not, you know, obviously you're someone could try and you're, you know, saying it's a coward's way out. Uh, unpack that a little bit for us. I make no excuses. I'm trying to be totally transparent to show the viewers. I take responsibility for everything I did, my actions. That's why I even take such a hard stance when people say I robbed my grandmother. If I did, if I did rob her in any way, shape or form, I would have admitted it. It happened. It was, I always said it happened. And that's it. I can't change what happened. But here, now I'm a better person. Yeah. Um, and that's it. I just like to nip things in the butt. I want to be direct to the point. And I have no reason to lie or BS anybody at this point in my life. And I just want to put a message out there for the kids, for people out there. People can change. You know, when I first came home, there was a relative that turned around, they're in my house. It's maybe I'm home maybe four or five months. And they passed the comment to my wife. Oh, he'll never change. He'll be back in jail in four or five, three or four years. And afterwards, my wife told me, I'm like, wow, that's what they feel. And I proved that a lot of people are wrong. 10 years strong, still out there. I don't even have a parking ticket, knock on wood. And um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, it's, I, it's, it's, it's taken a lot. It's taken a lot. Uh, there's times I've walked away from altercations with my tail between my legs. But I look at it, you know what? It's all part of changing. It's part of my new life. It's part of being a regular civilian in life. It's not always about violence. And uh, I'm still growing every day, learning, bettering myself. And I'm proud. I'm proud of myself, I could finally say, for making a stance, doing what I have to do. And just uh, being me, being happy again, being free. So the landscape has changed here on in the mob genre, including the most recent show, which seems to be a hit. I interviewed Joe Perry. Um, I believe his nickname's Little Snuff. I'm personally a fan of the show. I, I, I like uh, uh, Joey and Joe personally on the show. Um, you know, what do you think of Joey Molino having a podcast in 2023? Um, listen. He's still part of the mafia. It's a rat move. You do not do it. And lo and behold, he, you know, he says, I'm only talking about crimes in the past. Doesn't matter. He passed the comment, I think, last night. I can't quote it, but I'll basically paraphr uh, paraphrase. He was talking about himself um, where he said, I think he's a criminal or um, some type of, well, I wasn't always innocent, something to that effect. Now, here's what, and you don't think the government's watching? Oh, think about this. I know they are. Even though he said something, he made an innuendo, whether it be a criminal, whether it be, well, there's things I did in my life. Basically, he's talking about illegal things. 
You don't think, God forbid, if he gets another case, what the government's going to do? That little phrase, they're going to present that to a jury. That's going to help to try to convict them. So even though people don't see this, I pick it up because I know the laws. I've been in it. I've been in battles with the government. And I know they're talking about, and I said this before, one guy was on, they were talking about, oh, I could talk about statute of limitations. There are, when you're with organized crime, buddy, I hate to tell you, they could go back 50 years. And he is going to create a mega, mega, mega headache for himself and all the guys. Because all those little innuendos, believe me, they're taking notes. Check. We got him here. Check. And somebody, I think, said, well, I spoke to the lawyers and they said that's okay. Any lawyer that tells you it's okay. <laughs> it's not. Thank you. <laughs> and in our life, and I'll end it with this. Yeah. You're not supposed to be going on podcasts. You're in the mafia. And that's it. It's just, uh, I guarantee you, nobody will ever sit with him from New York. That's for sure. That's for sure. They're probably shaking their heads. What's it? Yeah, okay. The civilians out there, his fans, they love it. And you know what? I even said, I love it too. Yeah. Because I'll ride your wave, Joey. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had a strong viewership. Now I'm getting more people on board. Um, and like I said, <clears throat> I, I told the story about him and Chris Pacello. Joey came back, told his side. I apologize because... Yes, there's three sides to a story. I wasn't there. But um, as far as Joey, like I said, if he wants to say I'm a rat, I robbed my grandmother. Joey, you're out of the life. Come set up a platform. We could do it on your show, Tom. Say uh, it to my face. <laughs> we'll all meet in a secure location. Yeah. I want you to say it to my face. And yeah. Instead of being a punk behind the keyboard, be a man. Say it to my face. I'm not going to do any violence. I'm not going to raise my hands, but I'm going to tell you the way I feel to your face. So if you you want to call me a rat, but I'm standing up here telling you right now, everything I say, I'll say it to your face. You don't have the balls to say it to my face. And I'm not threatening. I'm not going to raise my hands. I'm just going to combat you verbally and we'll go at it. We could be heated. But at the end of the day, I like his charisma. He has a swag about him that people are gravitating. He's the only one out there uh, who's a live mafia guy on YouTube, and he's crushing it. And I congratulate him because it's helping me too. So, and I don't hide from that either. Yeah. Um, no, and you've been you've been pretty vocal about that. And I do appreciate you know sharing your opinion. That's why he's able to share his. You're able to share yours. You got to have some level of free speech. Obviously, you're open to a debate probably will fall in deaf ears but again you right at least, you at least you at least put it out there um all right so but don't you think also for example like gene for example right you tied up a woman that kind of stuff don't get me wrong i don't think you me or anybody wants to glorify what the mob ever did but the mob we knew growing up didn't do a lot of that petty penny ass stuff right it seems like gene's era that started did that happen because they picked the wrong recruits did that happen because they got they got etched out of the, the, the wrong rackets. Like, why, why did the mob fall so badly to Gene's era that you were like, you know what? Like, you're like, you know what? I'm going to try to take this kid and mentor him. But from a mobster standpoint, there's got to be a part of you that said, hey, I used to make millions in construction. You're tying up grandmothers. You know, unpack that a little bit. I think Gene was around the wrong influence, Vinny Asaro. Okay. Guided him, didn't school him, didn't help educate him. I think Vinny Asaro was a loose cannon himself. That's why he was shelved for many years. Uh, stories I heard about Vinny Asaro, and I never said this before. When he was a captain, he was abusing his guys around him, taking their money. And that's why he got demoted. That's why he got shelved. Um, so he was just a wild card, maybe chemically imbalanced, because it doesn't reflect on his son, Jerry. Jerry's a gentleman, knows how to conduct himself, more calm, quiet, reserved but we'll act if he had to. You mentioned that on your show. I'm just bringing it up because you, you, you mentioned yes. on your show that uh, you were in contact with some active guys. Why would an active guy want to talk to you? Why wouldn't they? Because they might risk the, the chance of them maybe giving you information because you've given information in the past. We don't talk about anything other than pleasantries, how you doing, how have you been, what are you up to, and that's it. 
I would never ask somebody active or anybody. I don't want to know. Yeah. I don't want to have any knowledge of anything. You know, I don't need to know for what reason. I don't care. Yeah. I care about your family. I care about how's the kids doing. How's the wife? What's going on as far as how's the neighborhood going? Uh, you know, how's the feast? Legitimate things, the things that are going on. And that's it. You know, uh, about what's going on in the underworld. I don't want to hear it. I don't give two shits about it. Does talking to you put that person at risk, you think? Um, I'm sure it does. But at this point, a few of them even told me, Dom, that they're this, they're this hard and disenchanted with the life. We don't give a shit anymore. It's just not what it was. When did it change? Um, I would have to say after Joe Messino cooperated. Uh, just a terrible void downfall uh, of the whole Cosa Nostra. I think social media had a lot to do with it. Um, from what I noticed, there's a lot of cooperators living in the Jersey, New York area, yeah. doing business with mobsters. Yeah. They're actually, they're known rats and they're doing business with mobsters. Why? Because they're giving them money. Wow. So, you know, again, they should be, you know what? I would do what I did 10 times over than be a mobster out there that's making money with a rat, that's in business with a rat. What does it show people out there, the mob? To me, you lose all respect, and it's not what it once was. Don't get me wrong. You still have people that are very dangerous, they're capable. That's why the Genovese crime family, they won't meet with anybody. They're underground, totally yeah. underground, protected. Yeah, about that, yeah. And it's so, called self-preservation of their crime family. So the Canadians were under the bananas at one point. You mentioned you speaking to Sal. Sal tried to go over there, commit a coup. Um, but now, and especially from Rizzuto on, the Rizzuto crew kind of morphed to its own family, became very, very powerful. They actually allegedly hooked, hooked up with Indragada. And, and the Italian mob in Italy um, and the Canadian mob and the Australian mob have grown, getting bigger, making billions. But the American mobs on YouTube, what did the Italian American mob do so much differently and fuck up versus the Indragada that turns over 50 billion a year? They're in Montreal is like a poor, obviously maybe because of drugs. But what did where did the Italian American mob go wrong? And maybe where the Canadians and the Italians go right, in your opinion? Um I don't think they went wrong so much. I think it was called Rico. Rico, yeah. Where they came, interacted that. Of course, in Canada, they don't have a Rico charge. Yeah. So um, I think this government was overzealous yeah. uh, with everything they were doing. And just uh, a lot of buffoons, a lot of people out there. Listen, John Gotti basically glamorized it, uh, put the spotlight on the mafia. Yeah. And then from there, the downfall came. Sammy cooperated, high-ranking member, public eye. And then now with Joe Messino, it's just actually the whole administration with Joe. On the boss, captains, <laughs> Joe was a disgrace. So I think that was the downfall of the mob. Now, you know better than me because you were in the life. But you in 2003, it made guy. From your perspective, was Canada still under the bananas by then, or did they separate off from your perspective? No, they were still under the bananas even when I was locked up. Uh, Sal, the iron worker, went up there to collect money, got the money. Uh, Vinny taxed them $50,000. He brought it down. Uh, they were still upset. But I think after Sal, the iron worker, got killed, that's when they definitely broke off. I, um, I heard from a pretty good source. And like I said, you're obviously hopefully answering good faith. That when Sal Vitali went up there, when everything was being taken over by Messino, et cetera, that essentially Rizzuto and his guys told Sal Vitali to kick rocks. So I haven't been earlier, but where do you land on that? If they actually told him to kick rocks, why were they sending down, I think, 10000 a year for Christmas? Okay. That's fair. You, again, you, you, you know. Right. And then why was even Vinny interacting with them bringing drugs into uh, the U.S.? Yeah. So well, they were well, all well, part of the bananas. Yeah. Well, my source also says the laws are different there. Um, they are, you know, there's no RICO. If you kill somebody, lesser time. So there's less fear for, you know, prosecutorial uh, 
blowback, right? Correct. However, it's also very tied in with Italy, and they still kill their informants, or they kill their informants. There's multiple cases of. Do you think if the U.S. adopted maybe a kill informant strategy in the U.S., that there would be less informants? Uh, yeah, of course. It's a fear factor. Or there would still be the same amount of informants, and the WITSAC program would be filled with a lot more guys. Or people would be moving and staying on the ground. We won't, yeah. I wouldn't be on YouTube if that was the case. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So in, in you, you, as I understand, you were active in Cosa Nostra 99 in 2005. Why do you think they chose you to be an associate and then later decide to propose you? Um, associate Vinny saw qualities in me. He, we gravitated towards one another. Anthony and Delicato, Bruno recommended me. Yeah. And they felt uh, they're getting a quality guy. Young, will back up. Yeah. And that was it. As far as the elevation, Vinny wanted me there. Just, God forbid, he got arrested. He knew I would take care of all his affairs and he'd get every dime he has coming to him. Yeah. Um, what type of money were you making? And if you could walk us through and unpack that is what were you making at peak as an associate? What were you making peak as a uh, soldier? And then what did you kind of make peak when you were elevated captain? Because I'm assuming your earnings would have increased. Yeah, no, everything fluctuated. It depends on projects I was getting involved in the new businesses I was getting in. It wasn't like, of course, now I became a soldier. I started making more money. Yeah. It's just in just as time goes by, you're doing more and more things, more come to the table. And yes, you're enhancing yourself in business. But, um, you know, I made a fairly good living. I kept on reinvesting it into construction, into land deals. So, uh, you know, I've amassed the wealth over $10 million within a five-year period. Joe Mussino didn't want to meet with you and Vinny wanted to propose you. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, that was at the restaurant. There was other people around and just Joe showing Vinny that I'm still the boss, you know, so it's my call. It's like basically telling Vinny, yeah, I'm the boss. So don't think I'm always going to say yes to you and you have to wait till I'm ready. Okay. So, um, you're obviously Italian American. Were your grandparents from Italy? What generation are you in this country? Uh, second generation, yes. My grandparents came from Italy. Uh, then my parents were first generation. I'm second. Do you know uh, where in Italy, by chance? Uh, I don't know the towns. I know Naples and Sicily. Okay. Um, do you buy into being an Italian American that part of, it's funny because my family's from Napoli, but um, part of the downfall of the Italian American mob is they were introducing people from different parts of Italy. I'll give an example. John Gotti was Napadon, and Napadons are notorious for being showy why Sicilians are being low key. In your experience with the bananas, it was a little on the Sicilian side, I believe, heavy. Um, did you see differences from maybe where they were from in Italy, or did you work with a few zips? You know, give us a difference of the Italian American and Italian machinations in Cosa Nostra during your time. I never really looked at it that way. Okay. Because, listen, you might have Sicilians that are flashy, some that aren't flashy. It, you have, it's a mixture. You know, to stereotype it in that way, you know, you can't because it's the individual themselves at the end of the day. That's true. And I never really looked at it that way, so I can't gauge it. Um, when I think about the bananas on that thread, when I think about the bananas, I, I personally think of uh, the Pizza Connection trial. I think of Knickerbocker Avenue. I think a lot of the old timers, a lot of the Sicilian born guys. What was the composition of your 25 crew? Was it mostly Americans? Was it mixed with Americans and, and quote unquote zips? What was the composition of the crew that you had? Oh, mostly Americans. Okay. Now, the Bronx, the Bronx has been notorious for having the least amount of main member informants. I think you may be the only one. Why do you think that is? Still a solid neighborhood. It's just uh, the way it is, the upbringing over there. Yeah. The, uh, it's the neighborhoods, too. I think they're more um, tight, tightly knit, where, you know, it's just the embarrassment, still that structure over there. Yeah. Where the other neighborhoods, it's not there. All right. So you, you got the pedigree from the mob. We spent an hour and a, over an hour discussing that. Your new venture, EG Vodka. I, I want to get a, an understanding: what business philosophies 
did you learn from the street and the mafia that you kind of bring into your EG Vodka launch and your current business ventures? Uh, my business ventures in the streets was always the hustle, how to get something sold, how to capitalize, how to maximize in sales. And we're talking in the illegal activities. So I take all those skills I've learned and put it into a legitimate package. Same, it's basically, it's, it's the same type of formula any company would put in place. Yeah. And it's just about marketing. It's about putting out a good product. And I just finished telling somebody today, we just had a massive contract today. Congratulations. We brought on. Thank you. And um, I told him, I said, you know what? It was easy buying into this company because I don't have to worry where I take this bottle and saying, oh, shit, how am I going to sell this crap? It yeah. stinks. What I tell people if I go into a restaurant, into a club, they look at me. I said, you know what? Try it. Try it. I'll let it speak for itself because you could take Tito's. You could take Kettle One. You could take Great Goose, Stoli's, Absolute. This is way superior than all of the above. It speaks for itself. If you don't like it, I'll leave now. You won't have to hear anything. And every time hasn't failed. Wow, I love it. I love it. It's smooth. It's great. And that's it. So I believe in the product. And that's it. It's easy to sell. It's not that when people taste it, they're going to come back. What got you into the liquor business? Um, my partners were, we were talking about years back, maybe about seven, eight years ago, we were going to come out with an erectile dysfunction drug. Uh, combination and it fell through. Wait, uh, hold on. I heard that's pretty hard to do. <laughs> ah, good one. <laughs> uh, at that time, that fell through, and then this yeah. popped up, and uh, you know, we merged. Everybody got together. Uh, there's six of us, six partners. We're all majority shareholders. All have the same percentage. Oh, I like that. And, and we're making the uh, company grow. We're trying to grow it. So um, it's called EG Vodka, egvodka.com. He's been very generous with this. I've got a few more questions, but I do want to share egvodka.com. I haven't tried to yet. I will try it shortly. It is available in New Jersey, which New Jersey is his. So that's the other question I have. You know, dealing with distributors by state is like their actual cartels in the true <laughs> sense. If you get on a distributor, you're in. You don't want to get a distributor, you're not. Some have buybacks, some have don't, some have rebates, some have don't. I don't know if you know this, but up until recently, and this still might be the case, Jersey salesmen and distributors were able to give cash rebates back to the owner of the uh, liquor stores. So it's like kind of mobbish. So did that kind of help you navigate the liquor business? Because li liquor business is fucked. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm just learning with that, with the distributors, how it's difficult to get in. Yeah. But once you're in, like I tell them, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vodka, it speaks for itself. And why wouldn't you take a premium vodka? Yeah. It only enhances your company because it's the quality is that good. I want to ask you a marketing question. Where do you see the positioning of it? Is this going to be my go to, you know, when I go out, my grab on the shelf for, you know, for watching uh, watching football on a Sunday? Where do you see this positioned? Um, I see it all over in the household. Okay. In nightclubs, um, restaurants, it is smooth. Like you could, if you have it with a mixer, uh, whether it's iced tea, lemonade, uh, even in martinis, it's so smooth. You don't even get hit with that alcohol burn where sometimes you sip. You yeah, like, you get a little reflux. Yeah. It's smooth. It's really smooth. It's refreshing to have a vodka this smooth. I mean, you can even drink it straight on the rocks. Zero burn. People are like, wow, this tastes like water. Is that clean? That's the better word. It's that clean. And also, and we discussed this, and we, we may do something down the road, who knows, but but you also were looking to create kind of a, a platform for men. You have the kind of the doctor, the ED guy, the hormone, you know, there's different stuff. You have a Correct. vodka, which people interested to, champagne to rock. I think you're working on some supplements. You know, if you had your druthers and you had a magic wand, what does your platform look like? Uh, the Sakali family Inc. in maybe three to five years. Um, I would like to have four or five more people sitting at the table with me. Yeah, all diversified, different 
types of backgrounds. And us put out a ton of, I'm doing a hair product for men right now. I'm testing it out. <laughs> but like I said, I want to test it out, make sure it's uh, quality, and then we'll discuss it. But I want to gear up for the man to accommodate the men and put out quality product that when they know, I, people know I say something, they know it's accurate. They could believe in the products. I already sampled it, tested it out. And of course, I'm going to have some type of ownership percentage in these yeah. companies because I'm building it. I want to build a platform and show people I came from nothing. I was released from jail. Yeah. Government gave me 25000 My mother lent me 25000 My wife borrowed 50000 And within, I'd say, a year and a half, everything was paid off. I was up on my feet and off to the races. So with hard work, with determination, anybody could do it. Anybody could do it. And for me, there's no room for failure. What's the first move you make when you're at that zero point, right? Obviously, you picked up your bootstraps, borrowed some money, rolled that capital, made some right moves, and now we're, now we're at a better place and, and, and are doing even better than you were. What advice do you have somebody who's really at that rock bottom, even financially, to help them get it out of it? Oh, just stay forward, stay focused. I remember, too, I invested some money into the stock market. I'm pretty good with stocks trading. Yeah. And this one day, I might have had 20000 in the market. So I'm yeah. grinding it out maybe 500 this day, 200 this day, 1000 the next day. A lot of daily earn. Damn. Yeah, no, but all of a sudden, I'm like, no. No, God, no, 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 no. I dropped about 15,000 to start. Everything just dropped on me. I was like, oh my. I was so sick to my stomach. Wait, what did you have, like options that weren't covered? Uh, no, just the stock. I wasn't into options at that time. Just the stock it went bad on me. Can you and share which one it was or you don't want to disclose? I'm not, I'm not even sure which one. Yeah. But it went bad and I. I was like just shaking my head. And at that point, I couldn't afford to lose anything, and I lost. Wow. That. Um, then the next deal I did was a piece of land. I went to contract at 50000 no, 55000 put a $5,000 deposit. Felt I could get the money up in time, maybe two days before the close, and I couldn't get the money up. But I was able to transfer over the contract. And I found somebody that would give me 60000 So I made a quick 5000 oh, off wow. a land deal. But six months down the road, that land valued at 110000 So I was happy that I got out of it without losing my five. I came up five more thousand. But it's always the hustle, the determination, staying focused. No matter how, how many times I fail, I fall. I pick myself up and I'm more determined, more focused to, to achieve and succeed in life. Is it true you shorted Tesla recently and made a few bucks? Actually, yes, I did. I shorted it the other day. Um, what made you short it, Tesla, which is already beaten up? That's a, that, that's a ballsy well, move. No, it wasn't beat up. What happened was I had Tesla stock. I sold it Yeah. Um, the day before, uh, the day before it dropped. Now, they were coming out with the earnings, and I saw it was going down. So I said, you know what? All indications were they were going to come out with bad earnings. Yeah. So what I did was I bought some options, some puts. Yeah. And during that day, I saw I was making money. I said, let me get out of it. I got out of it. So I made a few dollars there. Wow. And then I put in a low ball number, low ball number on the option and put it in, put the trade in. I left the house. I had to go down to Miami. And I'm looking at just the stock market. I said, ah, I never executed. So I didn't see it hit that benchmark. Yeah. They didn't go into the account. I was just looking at the stock market. Yeah. Next morning, I get up. I'm like, okay, I have some money to play with. And I'm looking. I view the account. It did go down that low. I got the options. Wow. So Tesla opened up. I sold that. It was, I paid for the option $6.26, and I sold them all at $19. So I crushed it for that day. <laughs> Now, today, what I did was I bought back stock. I put my buy order in at $210.50. Yeah. The low on today went to $210. Now, initially, I had it at $210. Yeah. What's it today? You know what? Let me just put $0.50 cents in there because I yeah, think just, 
I don't I didn't think it would drop that much. And yeah. if it does, I'm getting it at a good price. Today it dropped at two hundred and ten dollars and forty two cents. So I executed that today. I think it closed at maybe two twelve. Uh, yeah, two yeah, yeah, literally two two eleven ninety nine. Yeah, I'm up on that. So uh and hopefully yeah. next week. Tesla's an animal in itself. I think after two or three days of it being down, especially on earnings day, it got crippled. It was down like twenty twenty dollars. Oh, that's why I asked. Yeah. So um, I think uh, next week we'll have a good week. Even listen, a fifteen dollar rebound, I'm making a ton of money, so I'm good to go with that. So we're not going to give direct stock advice because next thing no, I know, not at all. Two, we're not. This is just two guys talking, but you seem to be somewhat prophetic in the space. What are some of the areas, without naming companies, maybe the areas and spaces you're going to put some bets in in the market, uh, maybe by industry or by area in the next, you know, next, from now for the next three to five years? Wow, you know, it's funny you say that. Funny you say that. I'm going to wait for my language with the attorney. Okay. But, and I don't know what I could say, what I can't say. Uh, with the men's product, we're merging with a publicly traded company oh, that wow. penny stock. Yeah, because so, you want you want well you can't yeah. say it. You want I'm not shell. saying anything want, else, but I could tell you this. You want the shell. <laughs> I'm gonna have the legal advice. Yeah. I have them write up how I could word everything that I'm in compliance. Yeah. Because I'm a 10 percent owner in the company. And then we'll take it from there. But it's a penny stock, I could tell you that. Yeah. And uh, what's it on the, pink, up, on the pink sheets? Working with uh, AI. So what's it on the pink sheets and uh, OTC? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I am screaming about AI, and I just feel like people are sitting there looking at me. I actually got half my questions from AI. I don't know if you know that. Oh, I'm listening. Hey. One of my partners loves AI, believes in it. Uh, we did our whole formula for men's, the men's product integrated with AI. So we, the website should be done. The platform should be done. Uh, it, it'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. I'm typing in, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm typing in who is Dom Sakali into Bard and see if you're on Bard yet. That's I, I, uh, I, I, so I'm in marketing. And I live and die by AI. I it streamlines everything we do. Um, yeah, Chat GPT is is. I mean, it, so so I don't know if you know this, but no. but you could you can create a Dom avatar. You can record your voice and have a big enough sample. Have AI write the script, and then produce a thousand mafia roundtable videos in about five minutes. That's wow. it's almost there. It's almost there. That's wow. where AI That's is dangerous. going. That's dangerous. Let me just see. So Dom Sakali is the son of Dominic Don Sakali Jr. Is that, is well, that fair? Was your father's I, nickname Don? Uh, they called my father Donnie. Yeah, the AI. Yeah. The former capital regime in the banana family, former associate as well. You spoke about your experience to grow up in the mafia has been critical of the life. In 19, you were sentenced to 18 months for prison and enrolled in a marijuana ring. Was released in 2020. That's not true, right? No, that's weird. That's why it. That's well, my it. father, I no, he wasn't. He passed away. No, I wasn't uh, released in 2020. Wait a second. So you since become public figure, appear in podcasts, documentaries, written a book uh, titled "The Mafia Life: My Story." No, right? No, I don't think so. Contra you're a controversial figure. Some people view him as a reformed criminal who's trying to help others avoid <laughs> mistakes he made. Other view him as someone trying to profit from his past associations with the mafia. Regardless of one's opinion, Dom Sakali, there is no doubt he's a fascinating figure who offers unique perspective on the world of organized crime. And that's straight from Bard. <laughs> Google Bard. So, so anybody real quick, so I'm not speaking a foreign language. There's two AI leaders right now. The first is ChatGPT. It's insane. You could like type anything in, and if it happened two years ago or later, it gives you all the information, a million words, real time. I need a podcast script for Don Carlo Gambino from the 70s to the 1975 about his life. Boom, done. Wow. Bard is a Google version, 
which is a little better. And then there's some other AI tools. You and I will talk separately because I don't want to give too much away. Okay. But AI is going to be huge. I I, uh, I see that as a space. Outside of AI, where else would you place some bets in t- terms of investing? Oh, uh, investing, I like uh, Meta, Facebook. I think there's yeah. a lot of upside to that. Uh, Zuckerberg is making a lot of uh, great decisions. You hear about the glasses, the Meta glasses? Yes, yes. Same. I love I love Apple. Um, Tesla, I think, listen, there was always talk about Apple coming out with a car. Um, yeah. I believe Tesla is going to be involved with that car just because Tesla came out with the new iPhone 15 where you can unlock the Tesla car with the iPhone button. Yeah. Now, how would Tesla correct the product in the new iPhone That's correct. integrate it so quick? So I believe Tesla, my opinion, Tesla is going to be building the Apple iCar with the Apple. And well, if you know, it's announced, Tesla is going to blow through the roof. It'll go well, up $100 in one day. Easy. Well, well that, that's an astute observation because anybody who knows, Google is all open source. So Google is like, everything's here, guys. We want to show everybody everything because we want people to come in and approve it. And for the most part, people like Android and people like open source. But Apple is closed source. You are not seeing their code or Correct. touching their code unless you spent a lot of money. All right. So how did Tesla get it? Yeah, Elon's smart, we, but he we smart. believe they have something going on, but I could be wrong. And then also another good stock, which I love, is that Timo. The symbol <laughs> is I don't I I don't want to say anything because I don't want to get like I can't even like you think you? I mean, well, you probably got a lot more trolls than I do. But at my peak, uh, like my wife's just like, get off the phone, stop <laughs> fighting yourself against these. Tro- I mean, I'm talking like, like, damn, I got a lot of trolls. So I, I bought Timu PDD at 72. Um, it's now at 105, um, and it peaked at 111. So I'm not giving financial advice. And the reason why I didn't want to bring it up is because it's a China stock. I don't want to get, you know, I am I am very pro-American. I am very big on uh, open markets and that kind of stuff. Um, but I uh, I echo that. I like PDD. Um, I think it's a hundred five dollars stock now. I think it's going to two hundred. No financial advice and no. no, tra- no tra- you know, I, tend to, I tend to agree with you to, as well. I think it closed today maybe one hundred three. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know why I bought it. Well, two reasons. Well, three reasons. One is my wife and my sister-in-law are very like up on things. Like they sniff out the trends before anybody. So I saw right. them on the trend side. Then the second was my sister, who's sixty-three years old, ordered from it, and she's the last person to do anything right. ever. Like she asked my wife thirty times, "Is it safe?" Am I going to go to jail? Can I order from China? Am I going to have to, like, I'm talking like literally spent like 70 conversations to order one thing for a $7 pillow. Right. right. The point being is the fact that my sister ordered and is in on this, it made it to the U S my first delivery was done by a private van on a Sunday, which shows you that they have the last mile figured out. The hardest part of the game of delivery is the last mile, as you know, even right. If, you buy it, right? if somebody orders it, do you use UPS, use FedEx, use Amazon, do you private 3PL? But the last mile they have figured out, that's when I got it. I got it at 72. Did you buy into it yet or are you still looking at it? Yes. No, actually, my wife bothered me. Get get the stock, get the stock. So what I did was I loaded up, which really didn't cost me much because the options I bought were only a week out. Okay. Just before their earnings. That is bought straight stocks. Yeah. I bought the options. I figured I'll take this risk. It's no big yeah. deal. Like it's not the end of the world, but the upside's tremendous. It, once the earnings came out, it was up maybe fifteen dollars. That's why I sold out at the fifteen. Was it fifteen? No, about twelve dollars. I sold out around the twelve dollars up range. Oh wow! Made oh, so chunk- options on that too. You must have made, yeah, a made a chunk of money. And then uh, what I did, even though it closed maybe five dollars more than what I sold it, I was happy with my profit. And I just bought more into the other day on the pullback. But I anticipate next week it should be up maybe another five to seven dollars, and I'll I get out at that point. It's I'm definitely not going under a hundred. Um, yeah, I just did straight equity because I, I I bought it in my uh, one of my retirement. Um, okay. 
IRAs. So even so, like, do I like I was like going to do? Do I sell it at one twelve and then buy it back at a hundred? But I'm like, I don't have a tax consequence. Should I do it? Right, right. I just let it ride. Um, I bought it to Target. I got a little beat up on Target. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little disappointed on uh, my Target. Yeah, I got beat up on Target as well a while back. Um, but you know, you win some, you lose some. You can't complain. Yeah. About it. How about I also like, like um, Apple. Yeah. Apple's been beat up a little bit. Apple always comes through, yeah. especially now if they do come out with their own car. Once they yeah. announce that, that's that stock big. is going to skyrocket. It's going to skyrocket. That's big. that's big. Now I it integrates would, everything Apple has. I would like when your deal is done, because you can't talk about it now. You're probably on some type of gag order. But when you – I am interested in talking about – how to get how to go public inexpensively and you hit the nail on the head if you could find a publicly traded company right maybe like a reverse merger i was involved investing in one and i bought into a a, a pink sheet company i made 50 percent pretty quickly but i sold apple to do so <laughs> like, that happens. yeah that happens. yeah I, but I, again but but i made 50 percent in probably about a year so i can't be a pig um right right but, but here's the thing and do you agree with this um, no, not everybody needs to like you, right? You got to people that like you, people that don't. That's just that's just life in the big city, right? But do you agree somewhat that there is a lot of knowledge out there, and you may not agree with certain stuff, but like these conversations need to have how to get our money right, right? Um, I finally am going to a physical trainer because I'm fat. You know, I know you're great at working out. I want to get some advice from you there. Um, my point being is, is there is there ever going to be a day? that this platform, even the mob genre, maybe there's sides, but can be a little bit more sharing of knowledge and actually be more amicable, or there's no chance in your opinion? That's what I'm trying to do with Mafia Roundtable. I want to make it diversified, have different types of people, make yeah. it educational where people can learn, grow. And yeah. we built something solid where, like the Kardashians, they put out a brand of lipstick. Yeah. Yep. I would love it. Like the, the multi-million selling a day. Yeah. I want to have a platform like that where people could believe in us, where we're helping people through workout videos, nutrition. Yeah. You know, I have all the ingredients. It's just putting it together, putting out the quality, being honest with the viewers and showing people, listen, if I did it in the mafia, I could do it in the legitimate world. It's much easier. Cool. Everything in life is hard work. Put the work in, you'll reap the rewards at the end of the day. What about working out? So I, my wife forced me to sign up the trainer. I've been going there, working out a little bit more. I'm do, doing portion control. What advice do you have somebody who needs to lose weight? And then, like, how do you get motivation? And what what should you start off with in terms of working out and being? First off, if you're looking to lose weight, I recommend watch what you eat. Yeah. Um. Don't eat past six at night. Yeah. Then the next morning, you could have maybe a shot of espresso, some orange juice. Do not put any food in your system till after 11 a.m. Uh, try to get to the gym first yeah. thing in the morning. This way your body's working now. It's looking to get um, energy. Your stomach is empty at that time in yeah. the morning. So what's going to happen? It's going to attack the fat cells, go after the fat cells. So that's way it's going after the fat, helping you lose weight. Yeah. And then your first meal, I would carb up and have some protein. Or maybe have some protein, then carb up. And then throughout the day, just small meals. Try to get about six meals in a day with proteins and carbs, and that's it. At what night, you, you want to walk, walk, yeah. do some exercise. So it speeds up your – everybody's metabolism slows down at nighttime. Yeah. It's just like when you have a cold. Yeah. Everybody feels worse at nighttime because your metabolism slowing down. So by you walking or maybe riding the bike for a half hour, an hour – you're speeding your metabolism up. So now you're going to burn more calories, especially if you have nothing in your system. Or your last meal was at six, you're going to burn off most of that meal. So there's a lot of formulas to it. I've learned a lot in jail. I yeah. had 20 years of playing around with my body, what works, what doesn't work, heavyweight, lightweight, medium weight, yeah. uh, working on an eight, nine-day straight program to working on a one day off, one day on, one day off, two days on, one day off. So I tried every type of formula you could think of and uh, I have a lot of knowledge that I do like to put into a video, uh, some type of educational help program. Yeah. 
people think, let me go in the gym, let me lift all the weights. They're always excited. But then the next day you're so sore, you don't want to go back into the gym. Little steps. I call it in my system, cracking the shell. Very light, very easy where the next day you're sore, but you're not that, oh, oh, I can't move my arm. You feel sore, but it's like, okay, this feels good that you want to go back. And that's that's where you have to start. And usually after seven days, your body is in a routine now. Like you, you want to do it. It's not like trying yeah. to wake yourself, getting in bed, getting in the gym. It's much easier. It becomes part of your routine. And you should do one body part per day. I, I was taught four sets of ten, four different, yeah, you know, four different exercises, four sets of ten, one body part, uh, a, a body part per per time. See, that's boring to me. Just starting out. I like mixing it up. I'll take two and three body parts. And maybe only do three sets of two two different exercises, high reps. Because remember, your first two weeks, you're not going to gain anything. All you're doing is breaking down. You're going to be sore as shit. So by doing it this way, it's keeping exciting. You're not being stagnant with, okay, I have to do four sets of this of 10. Four sets of that of 10. I like to keep it flowing where it's fun. You're going to different things. You're just touching base. You're cracking the shell. Yeah. Where after the second week, now you could start going into a little bit heavier weight, more of a structured program where maybe it's one body part this day, two body parts the next day. Yeah. And right now I'm on a four day on one off routine. Well, what about like, uh, well, you don't need it, but people that try the Ozempic and some of those weight loss, I mean, it's not meant for weight loss, but the Ozempic and. Uh, I don't believe in that. I really don't believe in that. Um, number one, it just came out. You don't know the after effects of it. Um, and you're just hurting your body. Put a little hard work in. Get off that table. Stop stuffing your mouth with food. And follow a little routine. Yes, in the beginning, it's hard. But like I said, after a week of following the program, your body acclimates to that program. So at first, you might be hungry where you want to eat. Drink some water. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe put a candy in your mouth the heart, just to get something in your system. But at the end of the day, after that week, I guarantee you, your body will be acclimated to not eating past six o'clock at night yeah. and not eating before 11 a.m. in the morning. You acclimate. Your body gets accustomed. Almost like a kind of a quasi intermittent, intermittent fast in a way. Got Correct. It. Got it. All right. Well, listen, this was a good one, Dominic. You're very generous with your time. Um, I'll give you the closing remarks. Your floor is yours. Uh, People, everybody out there, no matter how down and out you get in life, how bad you feel this times, even a few days ago, my my levels are down. I get depressed. Uh, Things are even struggles for me. No matter how well I'm doing, there's a lot of obstacles you have to overcome. And what makes it harder for me I don't have the resources that I built up for 40 some odd years when I was in the street. And I just say, God, please give me the strength. Help me. Help me get through this. But in the way I look at it, maybe God's keeping me humble. So no matter how down and out you are in life, maybe put the music on, listen to something you like, relax, do something that you know gives you pleasure, and it'll balance you out. It might not bring you to that high of pleasure you usually have but it'll bring you out of that depression state. You know, we all have it. We all go through it. Just, you know, stay the course, stay focused. And remember, failure is no option. And I'll quote this. Uh, It came from Tyler Perry, and I've said it many times. If people don't laugh at your dreams, your dreams aren't big enough. Great way to end it, Dom. Thank you for uh, so much for being on the show. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I'm going to have this reside on Mobsters, Inc., probably with some shorts on each of them. So the New Theory crowd, make sure you subscribe to uh, Mobsters, Inc. Dom, thank you so much. Tom, thank you.